Hi, it's Dr. Centeno, and uh, thanks for joining us at You've Got the Power. i uh, got an interesting topic today. I'm actually traveling, so I'm just doing this from my laptop. Uh, topic today is going to be an important one because I see lots of patients. When we order a DMX report, they'll get the report back, and they'll kind of freak out a little bit. Uh, the report's got a lot of things that are talking about damage this, damage that. Um, and it's important to understand how to put a DMX report into context of what's likely just sort of wear and tear uh, and what's likely causing some symptoms. And in specific to many of the patients I treat, what is likely related to craniocervical instability. I've covered this topic once or twice, but it's an important one to cover again because uh, I, I continue to see patients who kind of hit the panic button when they get these reports back. So I want to make sure that everyone can put those reports into their proper context. Uh, for example, there are certain findings on these reports that are just wear and tear, right? We all get wear and tear as we get older and uh, you know, what are the things that are on these reports that are likely found in a lot of people just walking around on the street? And what are the things in these reports that are likely important to pay attention to clinically? So that's what we're going to kind of go over today. Obviously, uh, we'll do it as we normally do. I'll give a very short uh, little mini lecture on this topic, and then we'll go from there. Uh, and you can ask questions about this topic or really any topic uh, at all. Uh, so let's see here. I'm going to go share my screen again using my laptop today. So this might be a little less elegant than usual, um, but hopefully we'll get her done. And let's bring up our topic today, which is this one. So again, today's topic is what's on my DMX, what findings are likely just wear and tear related uh, versus something I really need to be concerned about because it could be due to trauma or related to craniocervical instability. So DMX, as you all probably know now, but if you don't, um, it's real-time cervical vertebra movement as measured with video fluoroscopy. So that means that we can move the neck around in real time, we can see the bones moving, and we can try to determine what's normal and what's abnormal. Uh, the nicest thing about DMX is that when it comes to the kind of diagnoses that I'm using it for often, meaning to rule in or out craniocervical instability, we have normals uh, and we have abnormals, meaning that we have a paper now that's been done with a bunch of people that were normal and didn't have any issues, and a bunch of people that had traumatic, uh, traumatically induced pain. So we know what the differences are. Now, many times all sorts of things get reported on DMX uh, that really freak patients out. Uh, for example, there's lots of words in these reports uh, where they're talking about damage. Uh, and while some of these things truly represent some sort of traumatic injury that could be causing symptoms, obviously it all needs to be correlated with a physical exam and a history. Other things are found in a lot of people just walking around out there um, and aren't so concerning. Uh, and it's obviously very hard for patients to decide which, which stuff goes in which category. So what's what? You know, what's more normal, what's more abnormal as we normally uh, think about that. So we'll put these findings into three distinct categories. Uh, number one is likely related to craniocervical instability and the symptoms that come with that. Number two will be likely to cause um, symptoms, meaning if, if I see this on a DMX, I start to get concerned that that needs to be treated. Um, versus likely just wear and tear and part of the normal aging process, right? Um, we all get a bit of what's called degenerative instability as we age. 
Now, sometimes that can cause symptoms and sometimes it needs to be treated. Many times it's not causing symptoms and doesn't need to be treated. So likely due to cranial cervical instability, if there's C1, C2 overhang more than three to four millimeters side to side, that's that lateral bending open mouth view, um, then that's something to get concerned about. Uh, if there's C2, 3 translation forward backwards, meaning one vertebra sliding on the other more than a millimeter, then that's something to be concerned about. And if there's an ADI uh, or that space between C1, C2 inflection that opens up more than two or three millimeters uh, and less in older people, a little bit more in younger people, then that's something we might get concerned about. Now, likely to cause symptoms category is going to be when there's more than three and a half to four millimeters of translation. Uh, and again, that's one vertebra sliding on the other, forwards or backwards, in flexion and extension. And that 3.5 number has been used for a very, very long time. It's kind of the cutoff where we might want to consider cervical fusion. Now, these days, you don't really need to do fusion. You can just tighten down loose ligaments via injection. But if there's more than three and a half millimeters, that's something we may want to get concerned about. We're going to take a closer look at that area. We're going to try to see if that area is causing symptoms or not and what the risk benefit of treating that is. And then unlikely to cause symptoms, things like facet gapping, um, under three and a half millimeters of translation from three, four on down. Degenerative changes such as moderate foraminal narrowing, bone spurs, small amounts of retrolisthesis. These are all things that are probably present in a lot of people walking around the street right now who don't have any neck pain at all. So we got to put these with the grain of salt. Uh, or take these with a grain of salt. So just realize at the end of the day, um, it's possible that these things could be causing symptoms. They may need to be treated, but they're probably not causing symptoms in most people. So we'll go to questions now, but I did want to clarify that because again, I see a lot of patients, they get these reports, they hit the panic button because they're going into all these different things that are causing this problem, that problem, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of the day, you don't want to push the panic button until you know what's what. So let me uh, get out of that. We'll stop the sharing and we'll see if we have some questions to answer here. Looks like we got a bunch of them. So AT, uh, doing CBP and AO together, uh, good small movements or improvements, sorry. Also recently got custom orthotics from a CBP doc for leg length discrepancy. Will this interfere with AO doc leg length exam to see if C1 is holding? Shouldn't, no, but that's something to bring up with the AO doc, but I, I wouldn't think so. Uh, AT, opinions on a device called JAWS or size contraption you bite down on with the claim of strengthening jaw and TMJ. Some other patients believe it may be beneficial to CCI. Yeah, be really careful with things like that, because remember, one of the things that CCI tends to do is to overload the anterior stability system um, and you become dependent on that anterior stability system. And then that leads to TMJ because of those extra forces. So putting even more force on that system that in most patients is being overloaded because of the CCI is probably not a good idea. Now, it may make CCI symptoms a little better, right? Because you're dependent on this anterior stabilization system. So maybe you can strengthen it a little bit. But the problem is that since, since it's already being overloaded, if you add more load onto it, you may make one set of symptoms better, but you may cause TMJ on the other side because you're getting more load in the system than it was designed to handle. Rishi, uh, would getting another occipital nerve hydro interrupt the healing cycle from PICL1, have PICL and hydro on December 5th, hydro helped a bit, I'm still having nerve pain in the back of head, not sure if I should wait until PICL2, try another hydro sooner, what do you recommend? 
Yeah, Rishi, normally for um, the platelet growth factors and higher dissection to start working, we're looking at that six to eight week mark. So you're kind of right there. I'd probably give it another two weeks, see if it continues to calm down. If it doesn't, you could get another hydro done. Um, I think you're in Europe, so possibly you could get that done at Algos, Algo Cells. Caleb, uh, why are the super interspinous ligaments more important stabilizers of the posterior neck compared to the capsules? I wouldn't think the capsules wrap around the facet joints. They would be just as, as important. Yeah, the problem with the facet capsules is they're pretty incompetent in most patients um, who have any age uh, at all. So, for example, uh, I can inject usually the 5, 6, and 6, 7 facet capsules, and they'll leak and anyone over 35 years of age directly into the epidural space. Um, so those facet capsules just get pretty weak with age. So they're not major stabilizers in the same way that the supraspinous interspinous ligaments are. In addition, the supraspinous interspinous ligaments have much better lever arm because they're farther from that area. And we all know about levers, right? If you've got a long lever, uh, you can get quite a bit of leverage. If you have a short lever, you get less leverage. So um, I, I won't say that the facet capsules aren't unimportant, but I think they're less important. And again, this whole silly debate kind of starts with providers who uh, don't have enough knowledge and education to inject the actual facet joint. It's a lot harder to do. You've got to use uh, contrast. And they claim that they inject the facet joint capsules. They're not injecting the facet joint capsules. They're just putting the needle somewhere in the vicinity of the facet joint capsules. So it's kind of a silly argument, uh, meaning that it all starts because providers didn't get the training to do the more advanced procedure. They're trying to sell something. So there's, uh, they don't want to say they're injecting the joints intraarticular because they're not. That would be a fraud. So they just kind of say, well, I'm injecting the capsules, not really injecting the capsules. You're just putting uh, the needle somewhere in the vicinity of the capsules and, and crossing your fingers and, and hoping. Uh, Rishi, uh, how soon uh, until the CCI book is updated? Yeah, it's been updated already. Um, I've given it to my team to start putting the new one online. Uh, and I don't know when they'll get that done, but I'll probably check on it this week to see where they are. Uh, but it's already been updated from my, my standpoint, and uh, it's just waiting to go online. Rishi, if your occipital nerve was compressed for six months plus, and you had a higher dissection done, could the nerve take much longer to recover due to the amount of time it was getting compressed and beat up? How long? Yeah, I think we got a little bit into that. You know, six to eight weeks is a good amount of time to, uh, to use. Now, I can tell you from personal experience, and, and you know, it's always good as a doctor to start getting personal experience, which is, you know, that's why for a physician like me, getting older is a two-edged sword, right? My body starts to break down like everyone else's body does as we get older and we get wear and tear. And one of the things I recently got was some carpal tunnel syndrome, very mild. I had some platelet-rich plasma uh, injected, higher dissected around the nerve. And I would say it took my median nerve a good three months before it really turned the corner, but it was pretty amazing when it did. So I, I would say you could give it up to three months as well, uh, because that's been my personal experience as an old guy with a body that's starting to break down. Like I said, you know, for doctors like me, getting older is a two-edged sword. Obviously, it's tough getting old. On the, on the other hand, you get all this direct personal experience with many of these treatments and you, you get, you get to be the patient. Caleb, of all the patients you have treated for arthritic neck joints in your career, roughly what percentage of them have torn facet capsules? Um, again, kind of a silly discussion, meaning that um, I think as we talked about facet gapping, isn't really a thing um, in causing symptoms. It's just sort of normal degenerative wear and tear. Um, and there is no way to diagnose a torn facet capsule at all, uh, meaning that we can't see facet capsules on MRI, uh, even three Tesla MRI. 
Now, maybe with seven Tesla, who knows? You can see it, but those are research-based uh, images. So there is no way to diagnose a torn facet capsule um, using the imaging technology we have. The best you can do is to say facet gapping, but you don't know if the facet capsule is torn or just getting loose with age. Uh, Rishi, why would the FDA approve stem cell therapy? There's just not enough evidence that it works. Well, it's an important thing to understand uh, from the U.S. regulatory standpoint. It's different in different countries, but in the U.S. regulatory matrix, uh, if you're using something like bone marrow concentrate, uh, homologous use, uh, same day, and you're using it because it's got stem cell content, and it's minimally manipulated, then that's not regulated by the FDA at all. That's just practice of medicine. So it's a little bit like a meniscectomy. The FDA doesn't approve or disapprove of a meniscus surgery. It's practice of medicine. It's not what the FDA does. Now, if you do more than that, and let's say you were to take stem cells from fat after digesting with an enzyme, that's a drug. They have to approve that. If you want to culture those cells, that's a drug. They have to approve that. Uh, why haven't they approved those yet? There's lots of that going through the pipeline. Um, we've got a product going through that pipeline. Many others have products going through that pipeline. It takes about a decade and usually about three to $500 million to successfully get it through that process. Um, so there's just an immense amount of institutional momentum there, right? If you've got to come up with half a billion dollars to get that approved, very, very few um, cell drugs are going to make it through that type of gauntlet. Uh, and in fact, um, now that I've learned more about this process, if, if, you know, usually what happens is the only people that can afford to do those huge phase three trials at multiple sites are the big pharma companies, uh, Merck, um, uh, Pfizer, et cetera. And so usually what will happen is they'll acquire those uh, cell drugs after they get through phase two, and then they will go ahead and spend the huge amount of money, the hundreds of millions of dollars necessary to get the final approval. So that's just time, like anything else. Rishi, what are bone marrow stem cells that are most potent once re-injected back into a damaged area? When are they most potent? Not quite sure I fully understand the question, Rishi. Um, uh, autologous bone marrow stem cells will stay and play. Uh, allogeneic cells get taken out by the body. Uh, so if we're talking about autologous, then they're going to go through a healing response and orchestrating a healing response over that first couple of weeks. And then as it gets into a couple of months, you're going to get uh, engraftment and differentiation of those cells. So I hope that answers the question. Uh, but let me know if I didn't. AT, uh, for trauma-based CCI, there may be a neurology component that needs addressing. Thoughts and doctors that practice quantum neurology or come from Carrick Institute Functional Neurology. Is it legit? I don't know what quantum neurology is. Um, I do know what quantum physics is. Um, and I, my sense is it probably has very little to do with quantum physics. Um, kind of a physics buff. So I, I don't know what quantum neurology is. I am not real familiar with Carrick Institute. I'll certainly be happy to look into it. Uh, so if you want to drop me uh, a personal line at my email address, Centeno office at centenoschultz.com, uh, just drop me a reminder. Hey, doc, look into the Carrick Institute for me. I'm happy to look into it and, and see, but I, it's not on my radar right now. Andy, uh, if the neck muscles are chronically atrophied for a couple of years, but there is no fatty infiltration, can the muscle be covered through strengthening? Well, by definition, it's fat atrophy that we see on MRI. So there's almost always fat atrophy um, or fatty atrophy and infiltration. Um, I think this is an open question. We don't know the answer to this question yet. No one's really answered it, meaning can you get cervical muscular atrophy back? I think Jim Elliott, I think I've talked about Jim on this channel before. Jim uh, is now a professor at Northwestern. He started out as a physical therapist. He worked for us. Uh, Jim got the great idea to start looking at cervical uh, muscle segmental atrophy 
And I think he's shown that you can do some rehab there in select patients. As far as getting all of that muscle back, I don't think we know that yet, um, but I think it can be rehabbed. Uh, Ryan, I know neck pain is a symptom of CCI, more specifically, what types of areas or specific neck pain may be common with type 2B? Yeah, so type 2B, we're going to be looking for things like C1, C2 facet joint pain, which is going to be right at the back of the skull here. Uh, we're going to be looking for chronic neck pain, doesn't have to be a specific spot. Um, headaches, which oftentimes, again, are back at the skull here. And then usually there's another symptom, whether it be brain fog, um, blurry vision, meaning visual issues. Um, some patients have tachycardia, et cetera. Dizziness is usually a big one as well, or dizziness slash imbalance. Uh, it's been advanced by Jeffrey Savoy. I have metatarsalgia, right foot and both shoulders. Right shoulder has been repaired twice. I also have multiple myeloma. Can you help with these issues? Yeah, I would need to know more about your multiple myeloma. Is it active? Is it not? Um, and uh, usually platelet-based procedures would be a pretty safe bet. But uh, if we're talking about bone marrow-based procedures, then I'd have to know more. Lindsay, hi, do you ever see people have an entrapped dorsal scapular nerve that causes one-sided shoulder pain, extreme trigger points, not go away with even with dry needling? Um, it's possible. The dorsal scapular nerve is relatively easy to hide or dissect, so that could be an easy one to treat or block to try to see if the person gets relief. Um, just realize that just because someone gave you that diagnosis, I think your dorsal scapular nerve is entrapped. Doesn't mean your dorsal scapular nerve is entrapped, however, meaning that it's not like we can order a test that with 100% accuracy says that these people have entrapped dorsal and scapular nerves and these other people do not. Um, so we don't really have that kind of test available. Um, there's lots of other things that cause shoulder pain. Uh, obviously, outside of that, could be shoulder osteoarthritis, could be instability of glenohumeral joint, instability of the AC joint, could be irritation of the C5 or C6 nerve in the neck. So a whole host of other things could cause that. So, uh, but if it is dorsal scapular nerve, it's relatively easy to treat. Uh, Andy, you wrote a book on 10-week neck strengthening led by James Elliott. Uh, on both those patients that show reduction in fatty deposits and atrophy. Oh, you, I wrote a blog. Yes. Do you think uh, they would need to see more reduction as they continue? Um, yeah. So I, that's something totally different here. So the kind of atrophy we tend to see is, uh, as I've shown, where the muscle is 80% smaller than it was built and it, there's fat. Now, if we're talking about uh, more mild issues of having the muscle mostly intact, but having some small amounts of fatty infiltration, something like you would see in a shoulder rotator cuff scenario, um, then I think that is reversible. I think what we don't know is when we see these huge amounts of atrophy that we tend to see in CCI, can you get that muscle back, which would actually be an increase in muscle volume, not really a decrease in, in streaky type atrophy? Daniel, I have type one instability. Is PICL the only way to treat that? Uh, or can posterior injections help? Uh, so type one B, um, probably you're going to need a PICL. Uh, it's certainly a reasonable thing to think about. Um, is it possible that posterior injections could help? Um, even with a type 2B, which is one where posterior injections don't really help very much. I just talked to a patient about this this week, that there's a one in five, uh, chance that it will help. And this particular patient had already had two poster injections. He seemed to get some benefit from those. So I said, by all means, you know, if you're not in a hurry to really get this uh, 
treated you and you want to stay as conservative as possible, you may want to try another one or two booster injections, see if it continues to move in that direction. If it doesn't, we can always switch to PICL. So I think it's important to understand that um, I'm not against booster injections. They tend to be relatively low risk affairs as long as you are with a provider that knows what they're doing and that, that's staying within their lane, meaning they're not injecting zero one facets or sticking needles into the one two facet joint under ultrasound or something like that. Um, uh, so uh, the answer is probably not just like a type two B, but there's no reason not to try if uh, try some simple posterior uh, PRP or prolotherapy injections. Uh, Light hope one. If the DMX reports ALAR laxity, would it also equate to transverse ligament damage? If not, why is it standard to inject transverse ligament along with the ALAR during PICL? Yeah, so this is a, a really critical point to consider. Um, and that is that we tend to think of these ligaments as separate entities. So let's even just talk about the transverse ligament, right? It's not, there's no such thing as the transverse ligament. Um, you're like, wait a second. I thought we've been talking about the transverse ligament here. Why is there no such thing as transverse ligament? Uh, because the transverse ligament is really the transverse band of the cruciate ligament, meaning that there's a cross-shaped ligament, looks like a cross, and the part of the cross that goes horizontal, it, we call the transverse ligament, but it's not the transverse ligament. It's the transverse band of a bigger ligament called the cruciate ligament. Um, and the other thing to consider is that all of these ligaments up there uh, in many patients have connections. So we tend to call this one as ALAR, this other one is accessory, this one is transverse, but they're all part of a ligament complex that ties into each other. Hence, when we treat these ligaments um, and we're coming in in a above atlas or below atlas PICL procedure, um, you can't really uh, suss out the transverse ligament from the cruciate ligament. And you can't really suss out the ALAR ligament from the accessory ligament. Um, and many, many times, uh, all of that is intertwined inside a swollen dens bursa. So we get everything we can get while we're there because I can't tell you that there isn't a part of the transverse ligament that might not be abnormal. And if I can easily hit it while I'm there, I'm going to hit it. Uh, so that's the reason. Regenix, mid advance by Sherry Scop. Is it advisable to wear a neck brace for a long plane ride if you wear one in the car? Yeah, sure. I think that's fine. Again, just don't get too dependent on the neck brace. I think we've talked about this lots of times. Um, at the end of the day, uh, if a neck brace makes you feel better and more protected for sure, if you're going to be in an airport setting, in a plane ride setting for a couple of hours, then by all means, wear a neck brace. That's very different, obviously, than wearing it all day, every day, where it's going to cause severe uh, muscle atrophy and problems. John, any theory on why dextrose works better than PRP on ligaments on EDS patients? You know, John, this is probably um, related to genetic subtypes. And as you know, the vast majority of EDS patients have not had genetic testing. But in general, what I tend to see is, for whatever reason, prolotherapy works better than PRP. And bone marrow works better than both. That's just been my observation. Now, that could be genetically specific, meaning that, uh, for instance, uh, for example, in classical EDS, it's collagen 5 disorder. So uh, that may not work. And other subtypes of EDS where different types of collagen are involved. But I'm just telling you what I see in the vast majority of people I see. Uh, Thatchen, can occult tether cord surgery affect lumbar stability, causing lumbar instability? Yeah, Thatchen, this is a really important part because I, our, our issue to bring up, and that is, you know, I see a lot of people getting occult tethered cord surgery, and I'm not seeing great results, meaning that I've seen a lot of patients come in who are either much worse after their occult tethered cord surgery or have complications from the surgery itself. It's a big surgery, right? You are um, cutting the anchor for the spinal cord. And the spinal cord itself is a stretchy, uh, is a stretchy structure. So you're cutting um, the bottom part of the where the rubber band anchors. And as you might imagine, 
that's not going to so much cause structural lumbar instability as it will cause instability in the central nervous system, right? The central nervous system has to be anchored in order to function correctly. And if you take that anchor out, it certainly may help the few patients that have substantial issues uh, with occult tethered cord. But for a lot of patients, in my experience, it's not a net positive, um, meaning it ends up causing more problems later than it's worth, or there's some complications associated with it. Laura, uh, when you do PICL, do you typically inject capsular ligaments? Uh, we do if they need to be injected. So for example, I just saw a guy this week um, where we were talking about the very specific issues he had at his atlas and how his atlas kept going out in one direction. So we did some very specific injections at one point to the anterior facet capsule, as well as the ligament that is superficial to that in order to try to address that specific scenario and situation. But again, the whole facet capsule thing is much more, um, much more fictitious than it is real, meaning that um, it, this whole thing comes up because providers who can't, who don't really have the expertise to inject into the joint. They never really uh, were able to get certified to do that. That's fellowship training, uh, or at the very least, that's extensive training, proctoring, et cetera. Um, instead, they went to a weekend course to learn how to do some prolo. They stick some needles in the general vicinity of the lamina or the facet joint, and they call it a facet capsule injection. So it's a little bit of a, uh, a non-issue other than when a specific structure needs to be treated for specific reasons. Ryan, uh, I know in one video you mentioned two to 5% of chronic whiplash leads to CCI. Most people suspect this issue eventually find the way, way to you. What percent roughly of patients do you see you find have some sort of CCI? Yeah, so if we're going to say 2 to 5%, it's probably those people who have chronic pain. So it's important because this has come up a number of times, even in the peer reviewed literature where there's been some issues. Um, so what I mean is that if you take people walking into the ER who, after a car crash, um, it's not going to be two to 5%, it'd be much, much lower than that. But then if you take people who still have neck pain two weeks later, still going to be much lower than that. But if we're talking about people with chronic neck pain, so they've got chronic neck pain, it's three, six months later, they still have chronic neck pain and headaches. Uh, now we can get into two to 5% of that population. Those people who are still left over from all the people that went into the ER, all the people who had neck pain a couple of weeks later. Um, and now we have that much smaller population. That's the two to 5%. Uh, what percentage uh, of patients that I see have some sort of CCI, meaning these are people coming to me who think they have CCI. Now we're talking about even a smaller population of that group. Um, I would say it's probably 60, 40, 60% really have CCI. 40% probably don't have CCI. Uh, Ian, do you think removal of styloids and styloid ligament can have an impact on CCI and make it worse? I do. I see it all the time. Um, I, I tell patients this, and, and it's a very important thing that you're bringing up, and that is be very, very cautious in getting your styloid ligaments cut because what we tend to see is that makes patients with CCI worse, not better. Um, and it makes sense. We've talked earlier in this video about this anterior neck stabilization system. And, you know, a lot of people compensate for their loss of the posterior stabilization system by clenching their teeth. Um, and they may not be aware of it, but they are using these jaw muscles and the omohyoid and styohyoid and all of these muscles up front in order to stabilize their neck. So if you cut the ligament, and muscles in that stabilization system attached to that ligament, uh, you're not gonna have a happy neck if you've got CCI. Now there are people where you have to treat the ligament, but it should never be treated before. It should always be treated after. In addition, cutting that ligament is dramatically more invasive than anything we do with PICL. So again, we keep people safe in the medical care system by going up the ladder of invasiveness. You don't 
you try the next most invasive thing that's the most likely to help. If that doesn't work, you go up the ladder. In this case, that would be PICL first, style of hyoid ligament, uh, transection uh, after that. Uh, it's been advanced by Lewis Centro. How far advanced do we need to get evaluated for this procedure? Um, I'm not sure, quite sure what the question is. Do you mean how far in advance of getting the actual procedure? I mean, we're normally talking to people on telemedicine anywhere from one month to three months before they get the procedure. Um, somewhere in that time frame is pretty typical. AT, how likely is a patient with some dural infolding extension to cause symptoms? Is it a strong anomaly? You know, it's a good question. We don't really know the answer to that question yet. I wish someone would study this because it certainly makes sense to me. Um, so what, what AT is talking about is that when you bring your head back, the rectus capitis posterior minor muscle is believed to have a function in pulling the dura out of the way. So if the rectus capitis posterior minor muscle is not working, then you can get dural infolding. And it's believed that that can cause some disturbance in CSF flow. But I would love to see a study on that. I'd love to see some flexion extension upright MRIs that look for it in normal people without any problems and abnormal patients, because that would be a great study to see. Rishi, uh, I have jaw locking when opening my mouth, but I have no pain associated with it. Could this be TMJ? Yeah, probably due to what we've been talking about, right? As again, this dominance of the anterior stabilization system overloading the TMJ and that then causing problems. Ian, uh, you looked at my DMX and said no instability, yet I get symptoms relief from traction slash brace that pulls the head up. Why would this be? I must say the DMX was only flexion extension and included no ear to shoulder movement, no mouth shots. So I think it was not a full DMX. Well, by all means, get a full DMX. That's for sure. Um, I don't recall this uh, offhand, but get a full DMX. And uh, and why would traction help? God, lots of different reasons. Um, you know, normally this kind of vertical traction makes CCI patients worse. But remember, there's CCI and CCS. So there's craniocervical instability and craniocervical syndrome. Craniocervical syndrome means that there's something damaged in the upper neck that's causing the symptoms, but there's no instability that still needs to be treated in general. Uh, craniocervical instability means it's that plus the ligaments aren't doing their job of holding the head on and stabilizing the head on the neck. So uh, for example, if you had a C0, C1 joint injury, traction would feel great. Uh, so, and that's one of the things, you know, one of my criticisms, if you will, of invasive traction, because, you know, if you have a disc bulge in your neck, or if you've got a facet joint that's painful, traction feels wonderful. Uh, now, that's not vertical instability, um, but we ha have providers using that test to determine if vertical instability is present. So just be a little careful there. I think I have a whole video on that one. Uh, Liza, uh, long been doing osteopathic, uh, OMT, PT, myofascial work, and now my muscles are very loose instead of tight, but now I'm suddenly feeling much worse and more unstable. Should I follow with AO now, PRP, or more muscle strengthening first? You know, Liza, I'm not sure I could give a, a medical recommendation online uh, with that kind of information, but I can tell you that... Uh, that patients who are unstable need that spasm. So when you do something to take away the spasm, a, a common one is Botox, uh, then they get worse because their instability gets worse. Now, specifically, what type of instability you have? Is it type 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, 2A, 2B, 3A, 3B? I don't know. Um, so it's hard to tell you specifically what to do. Fatchin, muscles offer more stability with mid-range movements of the neck. Does this mean in theory that only mid-range motion should be encouraged for patients compared to full range of motion where ligaments are stressed much more? You know, Fatchin, I think you should do all the range of motion you can possibly do. And I think it's very important to not get into this fear avoidant behavior where uh, you don't move your neck at all because that then creates other problems. So even if 
you get symptoms when you move your head and neck, you want to try to do some gentle, slow, controlled range of motion every day to keep that range of motion good. Uh, because I think I see bigger problems when patients go wearing the collar full time and start doing other things to decrease the range, neck range of motion. So now we, then we have two problems. We've got instability plus no neck range of motion and one's almost as big as the other. Bo, uh, I will stop procaine injections at least a month for PICL. How long after PICL is safe to re, uh, receive procaine injections all over and for the trigger points? Um, you know, Bo, uh, uh, procaine is, is not non-toxic. So I think you would want to be in a situation where you just do trigger point dry needling. Um, that will, it's been shown to be as effective as injecting anesthetic. And it should be, it should take that whole issue away. So, um, but if you want to continue using procaine, that you then you wouldn't use it for about four to six weeks before. And then you wouldn't uh, use it for about a good uh, three months after. Uh, but I think it's probably just easier to do trigger point dry needling. And that way it's not an issue at all. You can do it right before and right after. Uh, Mohan, if a patient doesn't have CCI and is able to handle neck strengthening and decides to go that route before considered PRP to the upper neck joints, how long would it take to see some improvement? Um, yeah, so as far as neck strengthening goes, I think a six to eight week program should definitely show you some good improvement. If you're not able to tolerate that or not seeing improvement, then you would want to think about other things and next steps. Uh, Light Hope, why does BMC improve a more stout inflammatory or provide a more stout inflammatory response as compared to PRP? Uh, it's because bone marrow concentrate has more of those cells that are involved in that inflammatory response. Uh, are most IOF uh, physicians Regenix trained? Um, these days, not so much. Um, so we have, so at Regenix, we require IOF training. Um, then we require other training. Um, and then we do additional training on top of IOF training. So um, now, while it's true that all of our physicians have some element of IOF training, uh, the converse isn't true. Uh, IOF is a separate organization. Uh, they're doing their own thing now, which is great. Um, and at the same time, there's only maybe one out of every, every three physicians going through IOF who are part of the Virginix network. Um, so I hope that explains that. Uh, Light Hope is BMC injecting the neck muscles during PICL. Um, it can be if there's a reason to, yes. Uh, and certainly muscle tendons for sure. Brett, Dr. Centeno, about 10.5 weeks out from the first PICL, about week eight, things have been rough symptoms-wise. I spoke with a couple others, said this time period was rough too. Do you see this often? Yeah, Brett, it could be that that's part of a donut hole. Now, normally the donut hole, uh, just to explain it, is uh, after the acute inflammatory response is done and, and that tightens down ligaments and there's a honeymoon period, then that uh, acute inflama inflammation goes away. And then until you get matrix remodeling, um, we're not going to see much improvement until you get to like that three month mark. So probably just in that, uh, what they were talking about was that donut hole. Daniel, uh, how soon after a posterior PRP should I feel improvement? Four to six weeks is pretty reasonable. Jake Lawrence is Regenix good for osteoarthritis in the knee. Um, certainly treat osteoarthritis in the knee would obviously need to know a lot more. But in general, um, Regenix providers treat lots of knee osteoarthritis and, and those protocols work quite well. Brian, how reliable are patient self-reported VS ratings? Any advice on someone struggling to document pain levels by assigning a numerical rating? I mean, they're pretty reliable. Now just realize that you can put them in uh, much more context. So for instance, uh, questions like, you know, what's your pain right now? What's your max pain level? What's your minimum pain level? It gives more information than just give me a one to 10 uh, pain score. Um, 
And that's all MPS, numeric pain scale. Uh, the, the true visual analog VAS is kind of, you know, putting a line and then uh, putting a point on the line from zero through 100. But I think you're really talking about MPS zero through 10 uh, ratings. Uh, but I would say if you're trying to get more information behind that MPS type rating, then you would want to do things like we talked about or, you know, what's your maximum pain when you're walking? Um, what's your maximum pain number when you're just lying in bed? That kind of stuff. Those are all that all provides a lot more information. Rishi, is Algo cells authorized for a nerve virus section on LON, TON, GON? Is it safe to go there to have this procedure done? That's something you have to talk to those doctors about and their comfort level in doing those particular procedures. It's not something I've talked to them a lot about. Uh, for instance, you know, I think we've talked about this before here. We had previously talked about they were doing some upper cervical 01s, uh, 1, 2 facet injections. Then they stopped doing that for a while. I think they're doing it again. So I, I, I don't know. I'm just uh, giving you ideas here. Uh, Pator. Uh, what can you say about PRF or your frequency procedure in the C0C1 joint for CCI? Does it bring relief? Can it help for PICL treatment? According to the physio, I have a damaged ALR ligament. Uh, you wouldn't want to do any kind of radio frequency uh, ablation um, because radio frequency ablation uh, works by destroying the nerves that go to the joint as well as the muscles. Now, there is no radio frequency ablation for the zero one facet joint that doesn't exist. Um, it does exist for the two, three joint. Um, you could do a C2 dorsal root ganglion pulse radio frequency um, for something like C1, C2, um, but it generally doesn't exist for C0, C1, and you wouldn't want to do it anyway uh, because of those issues, meaning because it'll cause more instability. Um, so it's not a good idea after or before PICL be a bad idea. Any type of radio frequency. Ryan, looking at coming down for PICL in March to treat uh, CCI. Uh, in the meantime, I saw a video by Schultz on back rib pain, which I believe I have. In addition, possibly some shoulder. Would be a good idea to try to book an appointment to possibly further diagnosis these issues. Yeah. So Ryan, that's something whichever doctor you see could do all at the same time. Not, not usually a problem unless there's some reason in tolerating it for that specific patient. Rishi, sorry to ask again, uh, but you didn't answer if I was getting some or would it interrupt the healing of PICL number one. Yeah, Rishi, all I can tell you there is, and I think I've told lots of patients this, we haven't had a smashing success with people getting treatments between PICLs. I don't know why. Um, it would seem to make some sense, but you know, I would say for every three patients we do that, two end up flaring up, uh, one does well with it. So um, that's just been my experience. I don't know why. John, how long after I get PRP lysate into my disc can I return to lifting, lifting weights? Maybe you're talking about platelet-rich plasma there. Um, and that would be really highly dependent on the patient. Um, you can return to a light weight workout once the pain from the procedure kind of returns back to normal. And that could be different for lots of uh, people. I've seen people go back to do light weights a week later. I've seen people going back to do light weights. It took them three months to get there. So uh, it's very patient specific. Um, Andy, thanks for the clarification. Based on MRI, we have mild fatty Infiltration, but the muscles have decreased in thickness. Kind of putting your arm in a cast for disposable no fat. Yeah, so I think you're probably more in that category that we were talking about, where the muscle shrinks, um, and I think that's the big open question that we don't know yet. Uh, John, I believe I've, I have thoracic outlet symptoms. Can be coming from my bulges, or is it something different entirely? Also, where would you inject PRP to treat thoracic outlet if possible? So thoracic outlet is pretty common in many, many patients. Um, and if it's necessary, we can do a harder dissection around the scalenes. Um, it's, it's also can be coming from the scalenes that we're working due to cervical instability. So sometimes you have to treat the cervical instability. Some try, sometimes you have to treat the associated nerve roots. Um, 
it all depends on what type of TOS you're dealing with. Is it primary? Is it secondary? AT uh, is more specific. Muscle atrophy is something you notice more with PCI. CCI patients more dependent on a neck brace. Um, we see it in both people who use neck braces and don't. I think what we see in neck brace patients is uh, more widespread atrophy uh, in addition to the upper cervical spine muscle atrophy. Melissa, hello, Dr. Tenno. If you have a tethered cord, is it safe for adrenaline medicine doctors want to give you PRP stem cells in the lower back and epidural space injection? Um, now, Melissa, the first thing we have to do is to put this into two categories. The first category would be a tethered cord. The second category is a cult tethered cord. In a tethered cord, that's usually due to a tumor, um, so probably not safe to get this. If we're talking about a cult tethered cord, which is a completely different issue, um, then my question would be, how is that diagnosis made? Uh, meaning that I think that 90% of the patients we're getting at a cult tethered cord diagnosis don't have a tethered cord. And uh, there isn't strong information that supports the concept that these uh, people have an occult tethered cord. Um, but there shouldn't be any issue, regardless, uh, if it's an occult tethered cord, which is a completely different category than a tethered cord, um, in getting uh, a low back treatment that goes more to um, what kind of treatment you're going to get, how they're going to put the cells uh, there, specifically what type of imaging guidance they're going to use to do that, what kind of training does that provider have? Just realize that about 90% of providers that are doing low back treatments are really offering scams. They're just injecting the low back muscles rather than injecting things like the facet joints around nerves into discs, et cetera. But if you have a real provider who's going to do it and you actually have a true occult tethered cord diagnosis, then there shouldn't be an issue there at all. Uh, Andy, do you think uh, the trauma setting involving an accident, uh, there have been in cases of incidental findings of increased ADI during trauma workup where the patients have no symptoms? Yeah, I mean, just realize that we have to be a little careful. I think I did a video on this, right? In young people, the ADIs can be higher, all the way up to about three millimeters. Um, and that's normal because that's a cartilage bearing joint. And those people have more cartilage. As we get older, the ADI gets thinner. And so the tolerance for a guy my age for an ADI might, might be two millimeters. If it's, if it's above two millimeters, then that could be a problem in someone my age. Now you take that same two millimeters and you bring it to someone who's 18 or 20 or 25, it could be totally normal because that's the additional cartilage in that joint. So I, I don't think uh, what you're talking about has been adjusted for that issue. Melissa, what is the chance of PICL ever becoming approved by insurance or Medicare? Uh, it's not going to get approved by Medicare anytime soon. I can tell you that. Uh, as far as insurance goes, uh, it's covered through the Regenics corporate program. Right now, that's about 2,000 uh, corporations that cover it. But that's a small drop in the bucket uh, compared to the total insured healthcare market. Um, so I, I wouldn't hold my breath as far as uh, getting wide coverage for things like Medicare for this procedure. I don't think that's going to happen any, anytime soon. Andy, uh, does the posterior atlantic simple membrane provide stability? If it tears, can it cause CCI by itself? Yeah, it's not really a membrane. It's, it's more a ligament that's uh, adherent there to the dura. Um, and uh, we do see people with PAOM injuries. And it can lead to some uh, instability. Brett, would you inject something like torn ankle ligaments during a second PICL? Or, or would that have to be separate thing? Just recently, I'm showing torn ligaments left ankle from an old injury. Um, yeah. So again, uh, injecting that stuff is never a problem during a PICL. Um, the only problem might be if we didn't schedule enough time for it because the patient didn't tell us in advance or if um, the patient can't tolerate multiple injections because they're in that fragile egg category. Outside of that, um, I never had a problem treating those other things. We do it all the time. 
Uh, so whether it's a shoulder, an ankle, a low back, all of that is, is feasible and it kind of makes sense if you can tolerate it. Lisa, I've had a DMX twice with different chiros and could not see the ADI space like something's obstructing it. I do have a retroflex odontoid. Uh, would that be the cause? How can I? Yeah, Liza, I don't have enough information to, to give you much advice here. Um, uh, not quite sure why they can't see the ADI space. Um, there could be bone spurs in the way. We've seen that. The retroflex odontoid itself may be changing the angle of that space. So it's not a true lateral. But uh, again, I don't know that I can give you advice based on that. Uh, Fatchen, uh, from a stability point of view, is C1 shave a better alternative than styro removal? No, they're both huge procedures. Um, I mean, we're talking about really big surgical procedures. So now, so let's think about this for a second, right? Um, number one, all surgery is damage to accomplish a goal. The question is how much damage and what is the goal? Uh, in this case, let's look at the damage, right? So in order to get to the front of C1, what do I have to do? I've got to go in and create a tunnel. I got to put a retractor in there to open it up so I can see what I'm doing. I've got to dissect through multiple, multiple muscles that provide stability. So that means I've got to cut through the longus capitis muscle. That's an important muscle for stability. I've got to cut through the anterior uh, muscle or anterior ligaments there that provides stability in front of that area, including the anterior portion of the um, uh, ligament that comes from the transverse process. I'm probably going to have to sacrifice that ligament that provides stability to the anterior part of the atlas because it's where I wanna shave down. Um, I've got to make sure I don't damage the vagus nerve while I'm there. I got to make sure I don't damage the ninth cranial nerve while I'm there. I got to make sure I don't uh, damage the 12th cranial nerve while I'm there. I got to make sure I don't damage the internal jugular vein while I'm there. Um, obviously one slip of anything could damage all those structures permanently. Um, so we're talking about really big procedures with really big complications and consequences. Um, and sacrificing various structures that provide stability to shave that down. So I think it's important to think of that in that context. I think people think of surgery like, oh, well, my, my car got a flat, so I'm gonna bring it in, I'm gonna get a new tire for my, for my wheel and everything's gonna be good. Maybe they need to give me two tires or four tires and maybe they need to balance them, but my car will come out better than it, than it went in, right? Because I got new tires now. I didn't have new tires before they were wearing down. Um, surgery is not like that. Surgery is always damage. Focus on that word, damage, to accomplish a goal. The only question is how much damage, what can go wrong, and what's the goal? So I, I don't believe in the concept of shaving down the front of the C1 transverse process to quite try to quote, open up space in there unless all else has failed. There's nothing else that can be done. And uh, the patient fully understands that I might destroy their life forever by doing this. So very important to understand. AT, for dural infolding, have you seen cases with post-PICL MRIs where you've treated either anterior ligaments uh, for type 1C, RCP minor, and minor bridge, and the infolding resolves. Yeah, we don't normally get repeat um, high-level flexion extension MRIs, and usually when we see dural infolding, we tend to see it really on the ROSA MRIs. Um, so I can't say I've tracked one of these before, but I can tell you that we have treated ructus capitis posterior minor, and at least from a symptom standpoint, that's been successful but I can't say we've seen a lot of repeat, super high quality MRIs like the kind Scott Rosa does with flexion extension where we normally see infolding to look at, uh, to see if it resolves. So I don't have that data. Jim, I fixed my heavy head feeling and occipital headaches by 90% with muscle strengthening with specialized PT. I do have mild overhang, 1.5. Did I ride this train as long as possible? Sure. Sounds like a great result. 1.5 millimeters is not very much. So that's within the normal limits of overhang. 
Um, and it's fantastic that you went down that road and strengthened those muscles. Cause I think, you know, you'll serve as an example, hopefully to many that stability is half ligament and half muscle and that that muscle part is as important as the ligament part. They act in different parts of the range of motion. Uh, as we talked about in a previous video, ligaments uh, help instability at the end range, muscles help in the mid range, but they're both very important. So congratulations uh, on doing that. Levant, hi, Dr. C, can spasm muscles below C2 down to T1, pull the atlas out of alignment. Um, you know, there are some attachments in some people to the atlas of the scalene muscles. So you could get that kind of thing happening. Uh, so the answer is that could be, or you could certainly see that other muscles that attach elsewhere are shifting the head uh, because they're spasming and that's causing issues. Uh, John, would treating the C2 down help any instability with one level PLM epidural, C5, 6, or intricate ligaments, muscular, uh, or would only treating C01 help CCI? Um, if it's it, a lot, uh, John would depend on what kind of CCI we're talking about. So for or top, what we're talking about is um, type 2B, for example, side to side C1, 2 sliding, um, what you're describing is probably not going to help a lot. Um, if, on the other hand, you're talking about C2-3 instability, anteriorly, like a type 3A, it might help quite a bit because then you're getting those posterior ligaments, which it can help constrain the 2 moving forward on the 3 inflection. Uh, Yamas, I have C2 rotation. Why don't, why don't they inject it during PICL? Not quite sure what it is you're asking there, uh, meaning um, C1-2 rotation uh, happens due to alar ligament laxity. One of the things that can cause it can also happen due to scoliosis. I think we've talked about that. And uh, there may be specific things that need to be injected um, that you can, obviously I would discuss with your doctor, but I, I, I'm not quite sure the question here. Jim, from, Mo, from Mohan, gotcha, got that here. Does Regenix, uh, yes, uh, Yamas, we, we treat um, TMJ uh, for sure. Pator, uh, is there any evidence of improved effectiveness of PRP therapy if the patient takes a drug containing somatropin and human growth hormone use? Uh, no, there's no information or data that I know of on that at all. John, what is the worst case of CCI you ever saw? It required you to advise surgery right away. Oh, I've seen a bunch. Um, usually it's the ones where the ADI is so crazy big that I've got a pretty su substantial concern that that person needs to be stabilized right away. Um, or the, the DENS is so uh, substantially pushing into the upper cervical cord and brainstem that... Um, there's really no way we're going to help that patient. So those are usually the two that we tend to see. Uh, Light Hope, I, if I know a thousand percent, I'm not a fragile egg. Can I have blood below outlets? Sure. Yeah, not, not a problem at all. And guys, I'm going to start to wind this up because we're beyond an hour here and I'm traveling. So I'm going to uh, start wrapping this up here. So Yama, Sadak, what percentage of CCI people does improve? or uh, improve um, seven out of 10. And then Yamas uh, does Regenix do team, got, got that already. Uh, Ryan for type 2B, uh, when getting PICL, would it be a bubble out? So both, uh, usually both. Daniel, do you think that IGF treatment can improve regenerative medicine outcomes? IGF is like growth hormone. Um, I think it's unlikely that it improves uh, regenerative medicine uh, outcomes, uh, but no one knows at this point. Hello, doctor. Hope you're well. What do you think about shockwave therapy? Can stimulate soft tissues or is good data that supports this therapy? Um, I think if you're talking about a superficial problem, like for example, a tennis elbow problem, I think shockwave can be very helpful or a plantar fasciitis issue. But as we've been talking about today, many of the patients have craniocervical instability with internal ligament issues, not going to do anything at all in those patients. 
Uh, Yamas, does CT rotation get injected during PICL? Yeah, I think I've actually answered that as well. Um, in regards to my last question, theoretically fixing the curve in CPB could also resolve drill unfolding by taking pressure off, correct? Uh, it could, yes. Ryan, can loss of neck curve cause significant pain right in the middle of the cervical spine? Do I need to treat CCI in order to improve curve? Can yeah, so it can cause pain right in the middle of the cervical spine. Um, and uh, I would say most of our CCI patients can't tolerate curve correction until they get their CCI fixed, but we always encourage them to try it um, if they've got a lost curve because it can be very helpful in taking weight off of the upper cervical spine. AT, um, sure. Sure. Eric, uh, where can I find list companies for genetics covers? Um, yeah, I've been pushing them to get a list out, but I, I think there's uh, some administrative issues there. So the best thing to do is just call the Regenics call center, tell them who your employer is, and they can tell you if it's on, if it's covered. Raj, doctor, my left TMJ joint is hypermobile. I also have left side upper neck pain and other symptoms. Can the TMJ joint be causing this? Um, it can be, or it can go the other way as well, uh, e either one. Uh, Robert, Dr. C, had my procedure done three years ago. My day is doing fabulous. I recommend this to anybody. Great to hear it, Robert. And you had a knee, knee done. Great to hear. Thanks for everything. Uh, keep warm. It's freezing in London. Yeah, I'm in Seattle right now. Uh, it's, it's not too bad. It's a little cold, but, uh, I think it's snowing in Colorado, so it's cold there as well. Well, you guys, uh, have a great weekend. Thanks for all the great questions. As I always say, there's no such thing as a bad question. Um, goal is to answer questions so that people can understand this stuff. And so people feel comfortable. Um, I should be here this next Friday. Um, so I will see you this next Friday with another topic and more Q and a, so have a great weekend. Um, and, uh, I will log off from rainy Seattle here. I'm usually in Colorado, but, uh, visiting my son in Seattle. So everyone have a great weekend. Thank you.